You just thank the Lord right now. Where is the line to see Jesus? Hallelujah. Where is the line to see Jesus? Great song. Great thought. For I will be in the midst of those that honor me. I will be in the presence of those that call me Lord. I will be in the midst of those that acknowledge who I am and what I have done. I will show up when people worship and praise me and honor me. That's where I am. I'm in the midst of my church. I'm in the midst of the hearts of those that call me Lord. That's where I am, saith the Lord. Would you just praise him right now, church? Hallelujah. Now, the Lord, Spirit of God, was not talking about a building or an, a name on a door. You're the church. Church is you. It's not a, not a facility. It's not over there, over there. Church is you. You're the church. It's you. The church is not an ecclesiastical order or a denomination or an independent church or whatever they're called by. The church is you. So when you go shopping this next several days and you go to a store to buy toothpaste, there's your church. You go buy your groceries, there's your church. You go out to a restaurant and eat, there's your church. Church is not a place or a building, it's a heart. And you're part of it. Jesus is not coming back for a building or denomination or ecclesiastical order. He's coming after you. Hallelujah. The body of Christ. Who wouldn't marry a building, right? We're the bride of Christ. Who marries a building? I think I'll marry that building. The way things are today, I'm not so sure anymore. Not, God's not marrying a building. Jesus not married. Would you marry a, a, a building? Marry a person. That's what Jesus is. Amen. We've been looking at our Christmas ministry since September 24th. You just didn't know it. We start our Christmas series September 24th about seeing and spiritual sight. Last week as we go on, we talked about some real problems in spiritual seeing. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shine unto them. We talked about the problem of spiritual seeing. We have The difficulty of spiritual seeing was that the cause of it, and he says that, the fact of the blindness. Why are people so spiritually blind? We, we looked at a marvelous song a few moments ago from Wilbur about, about the glory of God, and we saw all those wonderful constellations in the heavenlies. How do you think they got there? By accident? Somebody, somebody has no sense to fill a thimble said it was an explosion. Have you ever seen an explosion put anything together? Have you ever seen an explosion go bang and there's a jet airplane? Explosions don't put anything together. Explosions do what? Tear things apart. So some, some guy with no sense enough to you know, blow his nose said that uh, there was an explosion. And all of a sudden, a world was made. Well, let him try that by putting dynamite in his living room and see what, if he gets a new house. You see, it doesn't make any sense. And 
the blindness exists. And the reason is the God of this age. And we looked at this. I want to show you, continue this. I won't spend too much time. See, it's the blinding power of unbelief. Unbelief is blinds us. And when we're blinded, we're physically limited. A physically blind person is physically limited. Like you don't want them behind your automobile on the highway, do you? They can't see. Of course not. A blind person in the natural realm is physically limited. A spiritually blind person is spiritually limited. So if a blind person that's natural can't do certain things, then a blind person spiritual can't do certain things. They're blinded. The very nature of blindness limits. The very nature of blindness limits. The nature of the blindness itself limits. And what the beauty of this is that, is that we know the Lord is always trying to get to the heart. The Lord's, the Lord's trying to get to the heart. The heart. And that's what Christmas is about. See, we started this September 24th. To Christmas, Christmas, you just didn't know it. So we've been talking Christmas since September. And see, to understand this, they must pass from, from darkness into the resurrection ground. We're talking about a spiritual person. They, they live in darkness, and they have to pass through darkness and, and live in resurrection ground. Notice the terms. They must live in resurrection ground. And that's when their eyes are open. But here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. Is that once you get there, there's liberty. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the, the Lord is that spirit. And those that, that worship the Lord will understand that the spirit of the Lord is a spirit of liberty. That when you're on resurrection ground, it sets you free. Remember last week I told you that... That the problem is people want to cling to that which destroys them. They just want to cling. They, they cling to that which destroys them. Instead of being set free, they cling to that which destroys them. Instead of letting the snake go, they go back and mess with the snake. I remember my mom told me years ago a story that actually happened of, a, of a, one of the workers that used to work on the turpentine mills. And the, uh, the, they were sitting down for lunch on a log that had fallen. And a man reached to get his lunch. And a rattlesnake hit his finger. And the man had enough wherewithal to immediately take his, he was miles from help, take his axe and cut his finger off at the knuckle to keep that poison from entering to the bloodstream and killing him. Now, he, he bled and he was injured, but he, he saved his life. A few days later, he goes back to the very place that, that the snake had bitten him. Now, the snake bit him and the snake went on. He cuts his finger off, finds help when he gets back and saves his life. So he goes back and he sees his finger on the ground. And it was huge and swollen and green and full of poison. So he takes a stick. This is an actual story, folks. He takes a stick and he prods his finger. And the finger bursts. And the poison goes into his eye and kills him. That's an actual story. That actually happened. My mom told me that story because it happened to some of the employees of my grandfather's turpentine mill. Resurrection ground, cutting the finger off. Going back is darkness. What an illustration, church. I never thought of it like this. He saved his life by amputating his finger with his axe. But he went back. See, that's what happens. That's what happens. That's what the God of this age does. Instead of 
being set free. They go back. Instead of living on resurrection ground in liberty, they go back. And he kills them. And that's what we're talking about. Let's look and continue that review from last week. I thank you for your patience last week, and I coughed my way all the way through it. Now, let's look at the cause of this. What's the reason of spiritual blindness? The cause is in that passage in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this world is the cause. The God of this world is the cause. The blindness is caused supernaturally. It's a supernatural blindness. It comes from the enemy. It's a work of the devil. This is why the conflict rages. This is why the conflict rages. This is why, this is why the God of this world gets them off of resurrection ground back into the darkness. That's why he pulls them again and again. See, it comes from the enemy, the work of the devil. And that's why the conflict happens. Even in Christians' lives, I guarantee you, if I'm not right, I'll take all of you to dinner in, in the year 2020. That sometime in your Christian life, the enemy tempted you to go back into the old life. Huh? It may not have been this week. It may not have been the last week, but there's a point in time when you gave your life to Jesus, the enemy showed you the grit and glitter of the powers of darkness. And it appeared to be fun, and you're missing something, and something's being taken from you, and this, and he tries to pull you back in the place that God has brought you from. I'll raise my hand on behalf of all of you so you can take me to dinner. In 2020. See. Spirit. Hear me. Spiritual sight. Is always. A battle. It's always fought. Battles are always. Raging. In this area. Always. Always. Now to see. Spiritual things will cost you something. You have said in many of our prayer times, I want more of God. I can't tell you how many times you've said that. I'm not counting, and you're not counting either. But God is, and so is the enemy. I want more of God. Check. I want more of Jesus. Check. I want more of the Spirit of God in my life. Check, check. I want more of the anointing in my life. Check, check, check. I want more of a revelation. Check, 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 check. You see, to see spiritual things will be costly. It's not cheap. I want more of God. It's going to cost you something. I want more anointing. It's going to cost you something. I want more Jesus in my life. It's going to cost you something. That's why Paul prayed a prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. And he says, I bow my knee. And here's what he prays. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. In verse 16, Paul says, this is why I'm praying. This is why I'm bowing my knee. This is why I'm praying. See, there has to be a price to pay. And there'll be times of great battle for spiritual sight. 
It's not an automatic thing. That's why there's so many Christians as blind as spiritual bats. They don't have a clue. They have no idea how this works. They have no conception of what I'm talking about today. They just don't have any idea. Are they members of church? Sure. They go regularly? Perhaps. Spiritually blind? Absolutely. In Ephesians chapter 6, again, verse 12 through 18, Paul says that the problem is darkness. And the problem is praying always. And the problem is in those passages, I'm not going to read them to you today. He says, I pray that he, Jesus, would give you wisdom, revelation, and knowledge. Then he talks about the armor of God. You don't need armor if there's not a battle, do you? You're going to put on armor and there's no, there's no battle? You put on armor in a war. And Paul says, put on the armor of God. Why? Because of the darkness, the spiritual sight problem. The spiritual darkness problem. The God of this age, he's speaking to church people. He's speaking to the redeemed here. Not the unbeliever. Because the unbeliever don't have any armor. Because it's the armor of God. God provides it. So they're out there streaking. There's a lot of Christians that are spiritual streakers. They have no conception of this. So the enemy can come in and just pull them right back into darkness. Well, I don't go to church anymore. I don't do that anymore. Ah, I'm not interested. I'm talking about church people, not unbelievers, because unbelievers don't have a clue. I don't, I don't want to go to church tomorrow. I'm not interested in that. That's spiritual darkness talking, folks. That's, that's spiritual sight blindness. Ah, doesn't matter. Another Sunday, it won't matter. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And the Bible says when Jesus came, the darkness was what? Remember? Great is the darkness. We're talking about Christmas message here from September. We're just getting closer to where we really need to go. And that's what happens. The reason? The God of this world. We are up against something supernatural. During the services, the God of this age will take our thinking and it'll go right out the window while the Word of God is being preached. Soof. We think about this, and we think about that, and we think about what we got to do tomorrow, think about what we got to do this afternoon, we think about where we're having lunch, where we're not having lunch. During the worship service, when we're, we're singing the songs of Zion and praise in the name of the Lord, we're not. No, it's singing, our head's singing, and maybe our mouth, but our heart is far from it. Worship time, we, we zoom out. Our attention span's about two and a half minutes long. Come on, church, amen, help me here. Zoom, here we go. I got dirty dishes in the sink. Well, sweetheart, worship God because you're still going to have the dirty dishes after the service. Worship God. I got to do this. I got to meet this person. I got to cut that. And I got to go over there. And I got to be with him. And I got to be with them. And, and the God of this age comes in and goes, Hello. The most blatant of this I've ever seen back when I was youth director, youth church, you knew that. And I watched a lady sitting in the service 
and she brought magazines to the service that day. Yes. And I saw her take out one of the ladies' magazines and flip through pages. I heard the pages rattling. I said, what's going on there? And I saw better homes and gardens, you know, you know, Southern living, cosmopolitan, and all the, all the messages that's in those magazines. And the man of God, the pastor, was speaking there, flipping through magazines. It had been better if they stayed home because it disrespects the Holy Spirit. End of the service, she took her magazines, put it into her magazine carry-on, said hello to a few people and walked out. been better if she would have stayed home. A pastor friend of mine said to me recently, a couple weeks, somebody outside this area. I do know people outside of this community. Yeah, yeah, not very many, I think one. He said this, he said, Ron, I don't know what to do. Seasoned guy. Not, not, not a rookie guy, first church with, you know, wet behind the ears and green behind the wet. He said, I don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean, so-and-so? He said, I preach my heart out. And no one responds. He says, I asked them to sing. They don't sing. He said, I asked them to, to stand. They don't stand. I asked them to raise their hands and worship God. They don't raise their hands and worship God. I asked them to clap. No one claps. He said, I asked them to, to look at their Bibles. He said, no one reads. He said, they're just there. And I said to him, my brother, Welcome to our world. God of this age, blind the eyes of them. God of this age, supernatural blindness. See, let me tell you something. Can I? Real quick. Let's see what time it is. I watch off. Oh, my goodness. It's only quarter to ten. That's fantastic. I'm on mountain time. We have family who's in Denver. Hello, Denver. I'm on your time. Now, listen to me. The entire forces of evil, the whole shebang, Satan's kingdom, in its entirety, every demon, every devil, every imp, every, every evil spirit, Everything from the hierarchies, from Satan down through the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, all the way down to the little imps that run around like little dogs and nip at our heels. Every one of them has one mission in mind. And that one mission is to keep you in spiritual darkness. That's what their job is, to keep you in spiritual darkness. And they're working, they're evil. And they're working their activity to do what? To pull spiritual sight away from the world and out of the body of Christ. The conflict. Is over. Light. It's over the more. It's over. When you say, I want more, you're saying spiritual light. You're saying spiritual revelation. And the moment you say that, the God of this world goes on notice. Instantaneously. The more you say, Jesus, I want more of your presence. Instantaneous. This week, Thursday morning, 
I had an old-fashioned visitation from God. And it was just like the Lord fills up the house. I said, you know, Jesus, I like this. I like the glory. You know I'm a glory guy. I like to bathe in the glory of God. So guess what happens Thursday afternoon? Hmm? You with me, church? Margaret in the ER. You pay, listen to me. You pay for the glory of God. You pay for spiritual light. It's not free. If you want it, you can have it. But if you want it, you got to battle for it. It's not free. The very conflict is being for more light. That's the conflict. Devil operates in darkness. For instance, Jesus is born. And what happens? All the children under five years old are murdered. Under two gets murdered. Cost those children their lives for the light of the world. And the grieving, the Bible says, for the grieving in Rama is heard. Cost Jesus, he has to go to Egypt because Herod wants to kill him. And he flees. Thousands and thousands and thousands of times in the next several days, that story is going to be cold. In innumerable pulpits, in Sunday school, <coughs> in pageants, it's spiritual light. That's the problem, spiritual light. And see, the more spiritual light, the more revelation. And the more revelation, the broader of the spiritual horizons. The more revelation, the devil counterattacks in conflict. Conflict comes. Con family, friends, neighbors, people you work with. The more revelation you get, the more conflict arises, more conflict goes. The Lord is after something in your life and mine. The, Lord, the Lord's heart. Remember we talked about God's heart in this series? Not what we want, what God wants. What is, we want certain things, that's okay. But what is, we have to say, God, what do you want? What is on your heart for me? Very few Christians say that. They say, God, give me, give me, give me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Very few say, okay, God, what does your heart want? What do you want from me? So the conflict, the conflict. So we say, God, I know you want something in my life. And I want to know what your heart says. And the devil says, you're not going to get it. Every time you say I want more of God, the devil says you're not going to get it. Without a fight. Without that wrestle. For he wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So therefore put on the whole armor of God. You don't need armor if you don't have a battle to face. Here's why. Satan wants to be God. 
tried that one time. For I will be exalted in the most high. Read it. For I said in my heart, I will sit on the throne. I said in my heart, for I shall be the most high God. And God said, out you go. And Satan's desire from that very moment, that inner rebellion in his heart was to be God. And he's still trying to be God. That's why he has Satan worshipers. So they can call him God. You're God. You're God. The greatest danger to him is spiritual illumination. It's the greatest danger to him. Spiritual illumination. It's like putting a light on at 3 o'clock in the morning in, in your kitchen and watch the roaches run. And the rats hide. Spiritual illumination. Here's why. Because once a person's heart is enlightened, <laughs> his power is broken over them. Spirit says, let me illuminate your life so the power of the devil will be broken over you and you'll be able to win the battles that bring you back from resurrection ground into darkness. Allow me to flood you with light so you will see that the battle you face can be won by my presence and power, saith the Lord. You just raise your hands right here and praise him. Hallelujah. Power will be broken. It's time to pay attention. What God is trying to say to his church. The apostle Paul saw was on the Damascus road. And Paul's telling his story, his, his testimony in Acts chapter 26. And he says in 17 and 18 that God was helping Paul, Saul, blind. He was, remember, he's blind, remember? God knocks him off his horse and he's blind. Does that tell you something? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against me? Off the horse he goes and blind he becomes. Spiritual blindness, Paul, Saul. And we're going to open you up. And what we're going to do is we're going to store your physical sight. But more importantly, we're going to store your spiritual sight. And we're going to change your name to prove it. Your name was Saul, big with men. I'm going to change your name to Paul, which means little with men, big with God. So Paul is relating this to a king in Acts chapter 26, verse 17. Here's what he says. Delivering thee from the people. And to the Gentiles unto whom I send thee. Uh, Paul, you're not going to go to the Jewish house anymore. You're going to go to the Gentiles. Look at this in verse 18. Here's why God did what he did. To open their eyes. Hello, spiritual seeing. And to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may... Receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance 
among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. That's going to be your job. In spiritual sight. Now, remember, what's the object of the devil? What, what's the, the object? Let me go quickly. Second Corinthians 4 4. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn upon them. The light of the gospel of of Jesus Christ the light of the glory of God the light of the presence of God the light of the Lamb of God the right of the ability of God that's what you, that's what he does he t he blinds us Jesus who is the image of God Jesus who is the Savior of the world Jesus who is light in himself Jesus who does marvelous things Blind. Blind. Every time you see on the news some kind of something or other, rebellion against God, that's the God of this age. Blinding them. Blinding them. Spiritually blind. I don't believe in this God stuff. Blind. You see, he doesn't want that to happen. The devil understands something very well. I'm about to tell you what it is. The devil understands this probably above everything he has understanding of. Remember, he's supernatural. The devil understands this probably more than anything. I think it's on his heart continually, constantly. And here's what the devil understands. If people see Jesus, God's son, he's done. The moment a person sees God's son, he's done. The moment, the moment a person's eyes are open and they see Jesus, if people see God's Son and God reaches them and they realize God's intention and they'll turn from darkness to light. What a wonderful thing when they see God's Son. Why do you think all the lights on the Christmas tree, all the lights that blink and flash, sure it's pretty. It's about seeing the light. Seeing the light. Seeing the light. What an immense matter. We should shout the victory almost all the time. Why? Because we have seen God's Son. They came to him. Through Philip. And I said to Philip, we would see Jesus. We want to talk to him in the physical realm. We would see Jesus. And when they saw him, they never were the same again. Once you see Jesus, you can never be the same again. Even people that are clinging to darkness out here. 
they're not the same because way down deep in their spirit they know and once you have seen him nothing else will ever satisfy an individual they play the song every time the enemy comes against you and tries to bring you back into a thought of darkness and lose the liberty you just look toward the light of the presence of God immediately turn and just look at the light and if, and if you're looking at the light you can't see the darkness of the devil can you Look at the sun, S-U-N, and see if you can see anything else while you're looking at the sun. Total overpowering. You go out and you look at the noon sun, and as you look at the sun, see if you see anything else. Just the sun. Look at the S-O-N, and you'll not see anything else in your life. Father, thank you for your presence, power, anointing today as we continue our series on spiritual sight that was started in September, running through Christmas. Help us, God, to understand that we must win the battle of the ages. We must defeat, by your power, the God of this age. So, Lord, every time we want more of you, every time we want the presence of God in our lives, every time we want to step up our spiritual life, things will go south on us very quickly. And, God, let us know today that we can have more light than we've ever had before. But it comes at a cost to us. We will have to fight the spiritual battle to receive the light. Help us to do so as faithful soldiers in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.